Today we have a very special guest, Kaisa Maitanen, who is a professor of industrial optimization at the University of Javascula in Finland. Her research interests include theory, methods, applications, and software of nonlinear multi objective optimization, including interactive and evolutionary approaches. She heads the research group on multi objective optimization and is a director of the thematic research area called Decision Analytics, utilizing causal models and multi objective optimization. She has authored over 200 refereed journal proceedings and collection papers, edited 17 proceedings, collections, and special issues, and written a monograph nonlinear multi objective optimization. She is a member of the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters section of science and has served as the president of the International Society on Multiple Criteria Decision Making, MCDM. She belongs to the editorial boards of seven international journals. She uh, has previously worked at uh, International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Astoria, KTH Royal uh, Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, Helsinki School of Economics in Finland. She has also received the George Cantor Award of the International Society on MCDM for independent inquiry in developing innovative ideas in the theory and methodology. We're very excited to have you here, Professor Maitinen, and uh, we can't wait to hear the talk. Uh, or data enabled multi objective optimization with interactive methods. But I was asked to start by telling something about my career, my path, how I have got to the position, uh, and, uh, and, and to, to work with these research questions that I am. So before I go to the main topic, I will say something about that side. And um, here is a map of, of Finland and Juvascula. We say that Juvascula is in central Finland, but if you look at the map, it is still pretty much to the south. As said, I come from the University of Juvascula, located here. So, um, after I have said something about my career path, I will uh, introduce some basic ideas of analytics and decision analytics that are paving the way to the main topic of the talk. Uh, Multi-objective optimization is my major research topic and in particular I have been paying attention to developing and applying interactive methods. So I will introduce a couple of interactive methods as examples and then I will consider an, uh, a real example of data-driven decision-making problem where we have applied interactive methods. This one is related to lot sizing in inventory management. Then I will say a few words about some other examples of, of this type of problems where we utilize data to make decisions uh, before I conclude. But as said, first about me and my career time because the title of this event is women in data science so i somehow bring up the gender aspects here and there in my talk uh, of this part so i i somehow got interested in mathematics at school and uh, at upper secondary school there was a choice to be made uh, whether one focuses more on mathematics direction or or not. I chose the mathematics direction which met, meant that I had very few girls as classmates. Um, none of my immediate family have ever uh, attended a university so they uh, I didn't have that kind of role models uh, nearby. But my parents encouraged me a lot to study. Once I graduated 
school, uh, many topics uh, felt very interesting to me. And, and uh, there was the problem of choosing which topic to actually study uh, at the university. It was so hard to choose. And there's some, some paradox of life so that as my research topic, I have come up to support decision making because I had difficulties in making up my, up my mind in my youth. So um, it was possible to apply to study mathematics at, at the university uh, without uh, attending any entrance exam, just based on the uh, how, how well I have managed at school. So because I couldn't cho choose uh, which entrance exam to prepare for, I chose mathematics because I, it, I my, my uh, records at school were good enough. So that was the choice made. Then I still had to choose which university to go to study mathematics. I applied several and they would all have accepted me. So that was a choice to be made that I, I selected Uvascula because it is it was not too far from from where I, I was born. It was in the Lake District of Finland and uh, felt somehow cozy. At the un university, uh, uh, at first there were quite many girls, but most of them basically wanted to be mathematics teachers. And, and then it was a little bit um, unexpected that the that the mathematics that that we were taught at the university it basically had nothing to do with the mathematics that we had been studying at school so it was a whole new field um, and um, uh, gradually I, I got interest interested more on applied mathematics and then multi-objective optimization was given to me as a master's thesis topic uh, with a kind of comment that somebody here should know something about this field. So basically I had nobody to ask questions because there was nobody who had worked on multi-objective optimization at my department at that time. So once I, I graduated with my, with my master's degree, I was encouraged to continue. And, and I still felt the topic somehow in, inspiring and interesting. So, so I continued. And uh, at that stage, there were no female doctoral students around me. There were no female role models. All professors were male. All, post, uh, all, all doctoral students around me were male. But it was something that I had kind of got used to already, as said, at school, very few girls around. So. I just continued my own work. Uh, the bigger problem was that I said that that um, at the stage of preparing a doctoral thesis, it would be really good to have a supervisor to turn to to ask for suggestions and test one's ideas. But as I said, nobody knew about multi-objective optimization, so I had to, had to work hard to find my own way, read a lot. A lot of material and uh, try to digest and uh, uh, establish my own uh, vision of what kind of novel contributions I could offer to the field. Uh, in the lack of a supervisor, I collaborated with another PhD student and, uh, and uh, once I had received my doctoral degree, uh, I got very positive uh, feedback of my thesis. And um, I, mel I, I made a monograph type of thesis. Nowadays, we typically mostly make doctoral dissertations that consist of journal articles. So they are kind of um, compilations of several individual journal articles. But at that time, I wrote a monograph. So it meant that there, nobody had uh, reviewed the manuscript before it was sent to the pre-evaluators. And it was very exciting to see what they thought, whether they found that I had done anything useful. But as said, uh, I got very positive feedback and I was encouraged to write a monograph uh, uh, of, of the material. So I ended up writing a book that um, has a yellow cover and that many, many people seem to have found to, to read basics of, of multi-objective optimization. 
uh, as a as a postdoc researcher i started to collaborate with more and more people around and uh, and i established my own research group uh, there were no other research group at the department but i i just felt that that uh, department is a too big entity for people to really associate themselves with. So I felt that it would be good to have a research group where people with mutual interests and, uh, and uh, complementary skills would be working more closely together and supporting each other. And um, then uh, gradually, different opportunities were coming up for different types of international collaboration and and for example met many many um, well recognized and highly regarded researchers by taking an active role in organizing a conference uh, in Uvascula and those fruitful uh, discussions in some cases led to very long lasting collaborations. So as said, I was encouraged to, to write the book and um, I realized the fact that I had been reading a lot of papers while preparing my, my PhD thesis. I rewrote uh, the text to, to a great deal to have a different scope, scope but still the, the amount of papers I had been reading was was very useful and then it was finally published in 99. Um, Multi-objective optimization is a part of the field called multiple criteria decision making and I had started attending conferences of the society, International Society on Multiple Criteria Decision Making because I felt that it was the closest conference series to my interests. So when I was attending the, the conference in 1997, uh, I was approached and invited to become the secretary of that society. So far, they had had no secretary and they had come to see that they would need one. So, and and um, I was invited to be in that role. So then I was invited to work at YASA, uh, International Institute on Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. And all these kind of nice opportunities came up and I gained more uh, on uh, experience and, and my uh, collaboration networks get kept going and and of course uh, being a researcher at least in Finland it means that you need to be ac active in applying for funding to conduct the research so that was also something that uh, by trial and error I also got some more experience and uh, also got some funding then I was invited to attend the very first <clears throat> international conference uh, devoted to evolutionary multi-objective optimization. So evolutionary methods are a specific type of methods for solving multi-objective optimization problems, population-based methods. And the interest in that field was growing so that, as said, the very first conference was organized. And, uh, and there I, I met uh, people working and, uh, in that field and because my previous uh, focus had been very much on MCDM, I started building bridges between EMO and MCDM type of methods because uh, there are these different two different types of uh, methods targeted at solving same kinds of problems in different uh, contexts. So when I started building these bridges, then, uh, then I, I took part in organizing a doctoral seminar where the focus was very much uh, about bringing these two different types of fields closer so that the researchers who would have otherwise been attending different conferences, publishing their papers in different uh, journals and, and, and uh, proceeding series, they would become more aware of each other and, and this this initiative has been very fruitful over the years. So I, I 
organized a total of four dark stool seminars with this focus and and according to the, their rules that is the maximum one can be involved but i have been attending many of the seminars that have followed this it is when it, when this tradition was started and the nice thing was that there were here and there many supportive people around who encouraged me to take new challenges for example i was encouraged to apply for a professorship on financial mathematics. At that point, I had been a postdoctoral researcher and so-called academy research fellow. So I was making progress in my researcher career. But at that stage, I didn't still find myself quite qualified to be a professor yet, but I was encouraged. So I applied and I thought that financial mathematics, that's not something that I would be at my strongest because I, I had been working on optimization mainly. But I thought that uh, let me give it a try. And to my surprise, I was appointed to that position. Once again, there were not no other female professors around at Helsinki School of Economics. But I was still working with multi objective optimization, but teaching a lot basic courses about financial mathematics. So combining research and teaching was not that easy. In the meanwhile, I was invited to the steering committee of evolutionary multi-objective optimization. So my, my attempts of building bridges between different communities were in that way recognized. And, uh, and then I was uh, appointed the professor of industrial optimization at the University of Uvascula in 2007 the position I, I still hold. And um, I am at the moment the only female professor of the whole Faculty of Information Technology. But um, if I go on, uh, as said, I had been a secretary of the International Society on Multiple Criteria Decision Making for several years. And the society uh, has elections for president uh, every four years. And then I was encouraged to take part in that election. I must admit that I had not come to think of the, the idea myself that I could apply for, for that, that kind of position. But I, I was then elected and uh, this led to a very long career in the uh, executive committee of that society, they have the style of having president elect president and immediate past president as the member of the executive committee. Uh, then I was invited to become a visiting part time professor at Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in Sweden. So I was dividing my time between two universities and traveling back and forth. Luckily, Sweden and Finland are uh, neighboring countries, so the travel was not too time consuming. But uh, I had to stop this part time professorship because I was invited to become a vice rector of, of the University of Uvascula in 2012. Um, the style there is that once a rector is appointed by the board of the university, the rector appoints vice rector. So I never applied for this position, but the person who had been appointed as rector, he invited me. And, and once again, there I was facing something new. I had no clue what the vice rector is supposed to do, what kind of skills would be needed. I had only the faith that he felt that I, I could I could manage. So I kind of uh, took the opportunity because I felt that this kind of offers, they don't come often. So if I don't try and see what it would be like, I might be having second thoughts later. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I found really found out where really clearly that I'm more a researcher person than an administrative person. So 
uh, once the my term was over, I returned to be a professor, but I still uh, think that it was a very good thing to do because I got to see university from a whole different perspective. I, I see the world in a more broader way because I am not only looking at the university from the position of a single pro uh, professorship, but from the I have seen it from the level of the entire university. So I, I lead my own research group, multi-objective optimization group and a thematic research area called decision analytics. And I am the chair of the university collegium at our university. And um, I have also many other positions of trust. So a lot of things to do. Uh, and, and supervising the members of my research group is the, I find it the most important part of my work. So that's the kind of a, my path in, in, in brief. Um, even though I had no role models, I was willing to work hard. And in many cases, it has been rewarded. Uh, but of course, as a life in general, but also for a researcher, there will always be some disappointments coming on the way. And, and it matters that one has a lot of faith in one's own work. Because if one doesn't have faith in one's own work, it is very hard to convince others. And, and this, this matters, the high own motivation. But in addition to the motivation also, I have been very privileged to have many supporting, encouraging people around me who have been encouraging me to go to directions I might have not otherwise come to think of. I might have not, not have dared to try, but this, this has been really, really re rewarding. It has not always been easy. As said, working hard has been needed, but having people around who have faith in you, it's really, really nice. And my message here is that, that when life throws in front of you different opportunities, something that you might not have expected, something you might not know that well, take the opportunity whenever there is some sort of interest in you, because you don't know what might come up. Uh, and and uh, sometimes these kind of uh, moments when you go beyond your comfort zone are the ones that really are the most educational and rewarding to you. But of course, one needs to keep some balance, because if one is open to too many opportunities, then it leads to the fact that that um, one gets too too tired and stressed, and uh, and uh, one cannot accept more tasks and duties than one can bear. And the nice thing with with the research work is the collaboration with many different people, uh, both in my own research group and with international colleagues, learning from them, hybridizing different ideas, brainstorming to together getting sometimes even really wild ideas. Sometimes they, they fly, sometimes they die, but um, this uh, interaction with different types of people, that's, the, that's a very, very nice and rewarding part of being a professor. So that was part of, of, of me. And now I go to the main point of, of the topic, so the analytics and um, uh, supporting decision making. Um, in the, these days of digitalization, collecting data is getting easier and easier. And in many parts of life, we think of, we need to think what to do with the data, how to make the most of the data. Uh, when, when analyzing data, we can really roughly uh, divide the analytics to three types. Uh, the methods of descriptive analytics uh, explain what has happened. So they, they uh, try to give some insight to the data. Predictive analytics makes forecasts and answers the question what has happened. And a prescriptive analytics uh, tells what should happen. So it can give recommendations. And we can consider multiple conflicting objectives 
and make uh, recommendations or suggestions as decisions. And here, this we call decision analytics. So utilizing data to make uh, decisions in the presence of conflicting objectives. So roughly speaking, we have some phenomenon and we can collect uh, uh, maybe different types of data related to the phenomenon. Then we use different types of analytics tools to understand and digest the data. And, and then we uh, involve decision makers and their domain expertise to set goals. What kind of decisions we would like to make based on the data available. Sometimes this might lead to the need of getting some more data and this, this iteration might take a while. Uh, once we are done, then we have uh, formulated, formulated an optimization problem based on the data and we can start the decision making phase where we support the decision maker in finding the best balance among the conflicting objectives. And then we reflect the, the final decision made to the phenomenon and check whether everything is okay or whether we need to um, reiterate the whole loop, maybe uh, collecting some more data uh, or, or taking into account some more perspectives uh, to characterize the goodness of the decision. So in my, in my uh, research group, we, uh, me and, and my uh, group members, we have been working on multi-objective optimization methods, developing different methods for a long while. And we also worked a lot on simulation-based problems so that there was a simulator that would mimic some real phenomenon. And then we would connect optimization to the simulator. And then we could, uh, for example, improve the performance of different industrial processes or uh, make optimal shape designs or improve the efficiency of different uh, operations. Uh, these uh, simulators some can sometimes be very time consuming. For example, we, uh, we can have computational fluid dynamic simulations needed to evaluate the values of the functions that we want to optimize. And this takes time. And in that case, it makes sense to use surrogate models. So, so fit uh, computationally less time consuming models and, and use them instead of the original functions as part of the optimization and, and call the expensive functions only whenever we need to, to increase the accuracy of the approximations. So that kind of experience we had and that, in, that encouraged us to switch to uh, dealing more with data uh, driven, driven problems. In, in a case, you can say that simulation based problems are also data driven or data based problems because you need to run the simulator to collect data for which you can fit the surrogate models or meta models. But anyway, um, experience with meta models and surrogate models uh, encouraged to, to move forward with data driven context. So, we, so to solve problems where we do not have any actual simulators available, but we have only data collected in various ways. And we have identified many, many, many applications for multi objective optimizations, uh, optimization methods in this field of data driven optimization. In particular, interactive methods that, that I mentioned at the beginning that I have been working most. Uh, we have gain, gained very positive experiences and, and this kind of interactive uh, involvement of, of domain experts whom we call decision makers. Uh, it can help in verifying the correctness of the model and, and, and um, they can also uh, learn more about the methods themselves. And we can combine different tools and techniques from different fields, for example, machine learning methods in various ways as part of optimization. So with the interest of utilizing data to more to a more verse in a more versatile way, we have a thematic research area at 
at the University of Uvascula called Decision Analytics Utilizing Causal Models and Multi-Objective Optimization. And the mission is to make most of the data. So um, not only making um, analysis of the data, describing the data, or not only making forecasts based on the data, but supporting making better decisions based on the data. And, and we say that we kind of uh, uh, create a seamless chain from data to decisions and depending on the data available and what kind of decisions we want to make, we have different um, uh, elements in the seamless chain in the modeling phase. We might need of causal inference. Uh, we need to op formulate the optimization problem. Remember, uh, if we know that what kind of decision we need to make, we, we can uh, establish uh, how we characterize the goodness of the decision to be make made, uh, we have uh, optimization problem that we can formulate to characterize different objectives that are describing the goodness of the problem, uh, goodness of the decision. And then eventually we form, formulate a multi-objective optimization problem and we can apply appropriate methods to support the decision maker in balancing among the conflicting objectives and find uh, better and informed decisions and we will work with various different application domains. So all have their own types of data available. So in, in a, putting the same in, in a somewhat different way, um, we utilize descriptive and predictive analytics to understand the data. Then we have this prescriptive analytics and multi-objective optimization, which we call decision analytics to make recommendations for decision makers who have substance knowledge and then we get feedback and preference information and a verification for the model and and we make new recommendations and the decision makers learn more and gain confidence in the good goodness of the solutions and until we finally get a final solution to the problem where we have utilized the data available in as versatile way as possible. So if we uh, look at multi-objective optimization problems a bit more closely, so they, they mean optimization problems where we want to optimize several objective functions simultaneously. And typically, at least they are at least partly conflicting. So that's how life goes. Usually we cannot gain everything. For example, uh, if you want to have uh, for, let, let's say that you want to buy a car. If you only optimize the cost, you, you would get a very unreli unreliable car. If you think of what other perspectives are important for you in choosing the car, this gives you other objectives like, for example, reliability or um, as slow maintenance cost as cost as costs as possible or or some particular type of uh, model of the car so depending on the person in, involved we can have different objectives that characterize the goodness of the decision and with multi objective optimization methods we help that the, the decision maker to find the best balance and when the when we have a different decision maker, he or she could, will have a different types of preferences and different types of interests, and and that's why we we say that we support the decision maker. We don't try to push some uh, some particular uh, prefixed solution to be selected. So we have these objective functions. I denote here their number by k, and they all are functions of variables denoted by x that can have also constraints limiting their values. And many times we consider of solutions in the objective space. So we have vectors that have K components and we call them objective vectors and they are very much communicated to the decision maker. So a decision maker is a domain expert responsible for the final solution uh, who can provide some additional information uh, about what kind of solutions are more preferred than others. 
decision maker is not supposed to be an expert in optimization, but a said domain expert. And with multi-objective optimization methods, we help the decision maker in balancing between the conflicting objectives to find the most preferred solution for the purposes of that particular decision maker. We can call the final result as the best compromise. And in the presence of multiple conflicting objectives, as said, we cannot optimize all functions simultaneously. We need to make sacrifices in one function to be able to improve the other. And, and that's why we define optimality by saying that a solution is better to optimal if there does not exist any other solution where, uh, where one can improve all the objectives uh, without impairing at least one of the others. So, for example, uh, visually, if we if we look at the case here where we have only two objective functions, both of them to be minimized, uh, and and so this is in the objective space space of the objective functions. So, if we, for example, look at this this point here, we know that we can make both of these objective functions smaller simultaneously. So this cannot be an optimal solution. But if we hit once we hit any point on this red line, we are uh, in the set of parallel optimal solutions because we cannot improve either of the functions without sacrifices in the other. So in principles, in principle, these parallel optimal solutions are, are incomparable in the mathematical sense. And that is why we need that preference information and additional information from the decision maker to be able to select some solution as the one to be implemented in practice. Uh, we have some other terms here. Uh, if we optimize all the objectives individually, uh, we get to see what are the best values of each of the objectives. But because of the conflicting nature of the objectives, uh, this is not something that is feasible. But it gives understanding about um, the fact that expecting something beyond this uh, more, more, uh, more better than the, that these values it's it's not uh, possible at all uh, we can also uh, in some methods utilize a so-called nadir objective vector where we have the estimate of the worst possible function values in the set of parallel optimal solutions this is something that we typically need to estimate but the ideal vector objective vector and nadir objective vector they give us the ranges uh, information about the ranges of the objective functions, the values they can have in the set of parallel optimal solutions. Uh, there are, as said, many different methods to solve multi-objective optimization problems. Many of them apply scalarization, so they convert the original problem with multiple objectives together with some preference information into a single objective optimization problem which we can then solve with an appropriate single objective optimization method. And by selecting the scalarization functions carefully, we can prove that we get a parallel optimal solution to the original problem. So not any scalarization function works equally well. For example, something that many people use a weighted sum of objective functions, it is not a well-behaving function if we have non-convex problems because we would, uh, because it, 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 it might not help us find uh, all different parallel optimal solutions that we would like to find. But as said, by selecting the scalarization function carefully, we, can, we have a means to generate parallel optimal solutions that reflect the preferences provided. Uh, Multi-objective optimization methods can be classified according to the role of the decision maker in the solution process. The first class is for methods where there's no decision maker available. So there, then we don't have any additional preference information and we just need to find some neutral compromise solution. In a priori methods, the decision maker sets hopes and expectations beforehand. And then the optimization method tries to find a solution that obeys these hopes as well as possible. But sometimes it might be hard to express preferences without knowing, knowing the actual trade-offs among the uh, solutions for the problem. A posteriori methods generate a representative set of different parallel optimal solutions for the decision maker to choose. So the decision maker acts 
after the optimization process. But it might be very computationally expensive and time consuming to create a good representative set. And it might be also cognitively demanding for the decision maker to analyze a large set of different solution alternatives. Therefore, I like interactive methods that try to avoid the shortcomings of the above, me above mentioned methods. In interactive methods, we uh, formulate an iterative solution process that is repeated. The decision maker is shown some information per iteration. One can provide preferences to tell what kind of solutions would be more preferred and, and gradually direct the solution process to find solutions of, of interest. So the computation resources and, and setting a cognitive load are most both um, uh, less demanding because the decision maker tells us what kind of solutions we should generate and, and we don't waste resources on trying to represent all possible solutions, for example, when compared to a, a posterior methods. Uh, the, there are different interactive methods and, and they differ from each other, for example, in the, in the uh, type of preference information they expect the decision maker to provide and also uh, what type of information they provide to the decision maker. So, uh, as said, uh, in interactive methods, the decision maker plays an important role. So if the decision maker is not available, then interactive methods are not the way to go. But uh, with one's desires and preferences, the decision maker directs what kind of solutions are to be generated. and and in that way, the amount of information to be digested at a time stays uh, decent. And we generate, as said, only those solutions that are of interest to the decision maker. A very important element here is learning. The decision maker learns about the trade-offs, the interdependencies among the objectives, what kind of solutions are available, how one's preferences are possible to be met. And, and thanks to this learning, one can adapt the, uh, the preferences and and uh, and converge to finding more preferred solutions. More understanding, more insight builds more confidence in the final solution. And uh, as said, there can be very different types of preference information, and we need to select the method that utilizes the type of preference information that the decision maker in question is willing and able to handle. Uh, for example, we can show a small set of alternative solutions for the decision maker to choose. And based on what kind of solutions that the decision maker chooses, we know what the interests are and can focus the uh, generation of new solutions in that area. We can have pairwise comparisons between uh, different solution candidates. We can ask for desirable values for objective functions or ranges for objective functions to, to focus on. We can classify objectives. I will say more about this uh, soon. We can utilize marginal rates of substitutions or desirability of trade-offs. There are many different options as said. The, the choice need depends on the preferences and the desires of the decision maker. In many cases, when we solve uh, multi-objective optimization problems with real decision makers, we can identify two phases in the solution process. In the learning phase, the decision maker explores different uh, solutions, learns about the trade-offs, learns about the feasibility of one's pre preferences, and eventually gets a rough understanding about what kind of solutions are available, and finally identifies a region of interest that is the most promising, promising area. And then in the learning phase, one fine tunes the solution finding in that region of interest to finally find the final solution. So learning phase and decision phase. And how, now I give you examples of two interactive methods. A non-convex pattern navigator is particularly well suited for the learning phase, for getting a rough understanding about what kind of solutions the problem has. 
So it, in, it, is, it enables the decision maker to study different trade-offs in a real, real time because, it, uh, because of the functionalities uh, underneath and it has a graphical user interface that communicates this information to the decision maker. So this method is also applicable to problems that have computationally expensive function evaluations because we generate a set of pilot optimal solutions beforehand without involving the decision maker with some a posteriori method. And then we utilize this approximation set in the, uh, in the method. That's why we don't call the original functions during the solution process and it explains the, the reason why we can say that we can show uh, something to the decision maker in real time. So this approximate, we create a new approximated problem to enable fast navigation. And non-convex parallel navigator is an extension of a so-called parallel navigator, which was for convex problems, as the name suggests, non-convex problems uh, can be handled with non-convex parallel navigator. They both have the same idea that we create this approximate problem uh, in the background. Of course, the type of the problem is different for different types of methods. So we can say that we hybridize components of a posteriori and interactive methods because first we apply an a posteriori method to get a set of parallel optimal solutions as input for the interactive method uh, that uses navigation. Here, of course, in the background, we also have the original problem. So the actual parallel optimal set, but, but during this uh, solution process, we work with the approximated set of parallel optimal solutions and an approximation. So after the initialization step, once we have generated the points and created that approximation, we start the so-called navigation phase, which is something that takes place in real time. The decision maker provides preferences in the form of aspiration levels, so desirable values for the objective functions. One can also provide bounds, so values that are that are limiting the function value so that the, the, no, the function value would at no, no point get worse than the bound. So what is desirable, what one would like to avoid for each of the objectives. And then with the real time dynamic movement, the decision maker sees how objective function values evolve when moving from the current solution towards the preferences that were desired. And at the same time, the decision maker learns about the trade-offs, interdependencies, and one can adjust the preferences to one's liking. Uh, this might sound a little bit abstract, but here is a concrete user interface. So here we have a, the pre-generated point set, point set and, and, the, uh, and the navigation started at this point. And, and here we have four objective functions. The blue lines represent the uh, desired values that the decision maker has provided and the navigation has has led to this kind of situation where one can see how the function values evolve, which ones get better, which ones get get worse and 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 eventually find the best balance uh, in this way. If another interactive method is Nimbus. I referred earlier to classification. So here the the preference information is given in a different way. The decision maker sees one parallel optimal solution and the objective values in, at that solution and, and is, is asked to say how the function values should be changed to get a more preferred solution. So we have five classes available for each function. It is possible that the current function value should be improved as much as possible or improved till some desired level, but not beyond that, that the current value can be acceptable or one can allow some impairment till some bound to allow uh, improvement in some other functions, or one can allow a function to change freely to see what happens with the other functions. So this method reminds 
uh, the, the user of the nature of Pareto optimality, it is not possible to improve all functions simultaneously, but some sacrifices in some other functions are needed. And, and here is the, the way how the decision maker uh, clarifies uh, which functions can be uh, relaxed, which should improve. And based on this classification information, the decision maker gets a sub subset of new solutions and can see whether some of them is a good solution as a starting point for a new classification or maybe even good enough to, to stop the solution process. It is also possible to generate intermediate solutions between any parallel optimal solution that has been generated so far. And it, underneath, we use a scarizing function to generate the solutions. Uh, we, we nowadays utilize typically so-called synchronous Nimbus, which uh, uses several different scarization functions after the decision maker has made the classification. And in that way, the decision maker can decide how many different parallel optimal solutions one, can, uh, one wants to see after the classification. And each of these scarization problems treat the preferences in somewhat different ways. And from there, those the decision maker cho can choose better what is desired, and 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 learn about how realistic one's hopes were, and adjust them as as much as possible. So supporting the learning is important here, and here is a screenshot. So here we have a problem with four objective functions. Um, the bar shows the uh, current value and and the by clicking with the mouse the one can provide the classification and get new solutions and and select some of those as the new starting point there are also some visualizations available uh, to support i promise to say about uh, data driven problems so let me say something about the lot sizing problem background first so Lot sizing is very important in production companies. One needs to have material enough to be able to produce the products of, that the company does. And, and um, the traditional methods typically are not supporting the supply chain manager usually use some kind of um, experiences from the past to decide how to determine the lot sizes. But this is very important to, on the other hand, enable the, the function, functioning of the company. But on the other hand, there is stochastic, stochasticity in the demand. And um, there are multiple perspectives to consider simultaneously. And one should not have too much money uh, in the inventory uh, because then it is out of the daily functions. So we had some data from a manufacturing company and, and uh, uh, characteristics was that the lead time from the order of the component to the delivery of the component was very long. And, and the, there was a lot of imp, uh, uh, need for supporting this, this kind of guesswork, how much of the component might be needed at the future times. So we selected one, uh, key component in the production process and obtained history data from past sales. And based on that, um, we the, the, the decision to be made was how many components to order in each month when the deliver of these components would take three months from the order. And we, we wanted to support the decision maker in making the orders. We made a Bayesian model to forecast the future sales based on the data and determine the relevant, relevant objectives with the decision maker in question. And here we had these phases, data from past sales, statistical modeling for demand, or formulating the objective function with four objectives eventually, depending on that forecasted demand and then the decision maker making stage where the decision maker act, uh, uh, solved the problem with interactive methods. I don't go to details of the individual functions. There were four of those. And as you can imagine, the decision maker in this case applied the, the two methods that I, I mentioned 
non-convex palatal navigator for the learning phase and Nimbus for the decision phase. And this was something novel that the decision maker could switch the method during the solution process. And the solutions were compared because we were using data from the history, we could compare the results to what kind of lot sizes had been used in the past. The decision maker in the solution process uh, found these methods very useful and supporting, and it gave him the very good opportunity to consider the simultaneous objectives uh, or at the same time. It was very insightful and, and actually what he thought he would like uh, he he changed because he learned so much about the uh, uh, conflicting nature of the objectives and eventually selected something that he would have would not have uh, thought of beforehand. So here's for example uh, for one month uh, the result that we obtained with optimization looks like this. As said, we had four objectives, and this was the real um, problem. A real solution that they had selected. So, and this this first one was about costs. So, so huge savings in costs and still acceptable values for the other objectives could be obtained with this supported decision making. And and we really noticed that they had been ordering far too much components in the past just to be on the safe side, and they have had too, far too much money in the inventory. And, and the, that was uh, kind of a damaging their uh, functionality. The decision maker liked the two types of methods and, and found the learning really insightful. Some more information about this can be seen in, in a journal article to, to, to appear soon. A couple of two examples very briefly, uh, for example, in uh, forest treatment, planning. Finland has a lot of forests. Uh, we have a lot of data about the forests. We can simulate the forest growth. And, and uh, the question is how to treat the forests, what kind of treatment uh, management uh, regime to select for different parts of the forest by selecting different objectives that we, cons that, that, that we regard important, we can support. The other example from a very different field of life is is patients with knee osteoarthritis. We know information about how different uh, exercise therapies have been useful for different types of patients. So we can make recommendations uh, which type of exercise therapy modality to recommend to in each individual patient. So the point here is that there are applications for data-driven decision-making in all types of uh, this is all, all life parts of life uh, as long as we have data available. Very briefly, I would like to just say a few words about our current research interests. Uh, uh, on top of what I have said, we want to uh, work with comparing interactive methods in different ways. We work with visualizations to support decision maker in gaining more insight of the data. We think of explanations to support decision making challenges of computationally expensive problems, challenges of all uh, various types of real life applications inspire our method development. And besides, we develop Desto, which is an open source software framework for interactive methods. Here is the URL. It is uh, modular. And, and the idea is that, that by having different methods in the same environment, one can compare them one can switch the method and having the, all this available avail, uh, or openly enables uh, further development. It, it enables implementing new methods by using the modules and only implementing the parts that are missing and, um, and makes them, as said, uh, very, very conveniently available for, for various persons who, are, who, have, who face problems to be solved. Uh, I don't have time to do talk about that, but to conclude, uh, we have a lot of data that we can make more, most, more use of by utilizing uh, decision analytics tools together with uh, multi-objective optimization. And uh, in that way, we can utilize the data to, to the fullest 
support people making more informed decisions and, and learn about uh, the phenomena involved in a more uh, depth, in-depth way. Decision maker gains insight and confidence and can also justify the solutions better thanks to the insight. So finally, compromise, compromise is better than optimum. Optimizing several op objectives simultaneously is better than optimizing one and ignoring the others. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. Thanks for your interest and patience. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor Miatinen. Um, it's always great to meet friends from Finland. Um, uh, so um, right now, I would like to uh, invite all our participants to share their questions or comments. If you have, you may uh, share um, your comments, any question, any comment in the chat, or you can do it directly uh, here. Uh, you can turn your camera on and just ask. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. It was great and uh, very insightful. And uh, I really think that you're such a great role model for uh, young women. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I also have a question. I wanted to understand what's the difference between uh, multi-criteria decision making and uh, multi-objective optimization. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I indeed... Uh took the took this um, distinction very very briefly so to me multiple criteria decision making is an umbrella term that that contains all types of problems that have multiple criteria characterizing the decision but multi-objective optimization problems are as said are a subset where we have uh, functions to optimize that depend on decision variables we have also problems uh, that are so-called multiple criteria decision analysis problems where we have a discrete pre-given set of choices to choose from. For example, choosing an apartment or choosing a, a, a place for some particular industrial complexity so, so that we have a pre-given set of toy alternatives that, that are characterized by different conflicting objectives, and we need to, to make the choice among this typically pretty small set of options. In multi-objective optimization, we have this dependence on, on functions and variables. And when we have um, real-valued function of real-valued variables, for example, it means that we need to, we can have an infinite number of different solution options, and we first need to generate the solutions before we can start comparing them. So the existence of, of variables and functions characterizes optimization problems, and, and then we have problems where we don't have this kind of roles, but we just have the alternatives to choose from, and they all belong to the field of multiple criteria decision making. Was this helping at all? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Any further thoughts? Yes, I have a question. Please. First, thank you for this amazing talk. Yeah. Okay, for what I know, when we deal with convex problem, we have only a global minimum. And if I got you right, you mentioned if the problem is non-convex, we can apply a scalarization method. So can you say more about it? Okay, thank you. Um, so there are different, these are different uh, things. So um, you are right that, um, if we have a convex problem, we know that local optimum is also a global optimum, so it makes our life much easier. In the non-convex world, we can get trapped at local optima, 
and we need to select the solvers very very carefully and and uh, depending so so uh, and scarization functions as such they are not um, um, dependent on convexity or non-convexity they are a different thing so we when we we can deal with convex and non-convex problems both with scarizing functions we just need to find an appropriate single objective solver to solve the scarized problem and if the problem is convex we can use very very well known uh, local solvers like sqp or whatever you, we like depending on the characteristics of the problem. If the problem is non-convex, then we need to use global optimization methods. So for example, uh, meta heuristics like, like uh, uh, evolutionary algorithms or particle swore optimization, or, or then uh, um, other types of global optimization methods. So, so this is a challenge because um, there is a possibility also in principle to get trapped at locally parallel optimal solutions in the same way we can get trapped at locally uh, optimal solutions in the single objective optimization case. So this is a very important, it is a very important thing to understand a little bit more about the nature of the problem that you are considering so that you apply the appropriate tools. But the, as far as the scarizing function is concerned, it is, it is a type of generating Pareto optimal solutions. And, and I didn't talk about that much about other types of methods, but, but we have also for example, population-based methods that try mm -hmm. to to die, they, they they are heuristic by nature, but uh, so they can be they cannot guarantee optimality. But on the other hand, they can they can be applied for very demanding problems, uh, and they can be really successful uh, in practice. And and they. For example, evolutionary algorithms they have a population of solution candidates, and then you manipulate this population with different operations uh, operators that are called for example crossover and mutation and you try to push that population towards the set of parrot optimal solutions to get an approximation of parrot optimal uh, solutions so so they are the other side of of um, uh, types of methods, very different for, uh, working principle. And you can also hybridize these different ideas, uh, having a population based and scarization based methods combined in different ways. So I'm sorry, I'm giving very lengthy answers, but <laughs> but I hope that I, I managed to somehow clarify the matter that on one hand, we have scarization. And the other hand, on the other hand, we have yeah. local and global optimality with yes. convex and non-convex problems. But was I answering your concern at all? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> OK, thanks for your question. Yeah, I have another concern. Until now, yes. today was my first time to read about Pareto Navigator. So I don't know if, if is this a tool, or is it performing Pareto analysis? Or so, so Pareto Navigator, it's the name of the method. So as I said, we have different, many different interactive methods have been developed. And I gave these two interactive methods just as examples, not to confuse you too much with a huge amount of different methods. I would, if I had had more time, I would have shown you many more nice methods. They all have their nice properties. But the idea in, in these methods is that in a way, uh, one the decision maker can navigate in the set of parallel optimal solutions the underlying mechanisms there are helping the decision maker in moving in the set of parallel optimal solutions so one the decision maker provides preference information and then the system reacts and shows what kind of parallel optimal solutions would be on the way uh, to move according to the preferences from the current solution towards the new the right new direction so it's kind of a driving around in the set of parallel optimal solutions mm -hmm. and we have these different methods that that are appropriate for convex or non-convex problems because as you know non-convexity it creates always more challenges for example the parallel optimal set can be disconnected 
in the case of non-convex problems, which would never happen in, in case of convex problems. So, so different types of, of mechanisms, mechanisms underneath. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so is, a, is this a kind of, let's say green chair when you find the optimal parameter? So yes, it is, it is a way to find the best balance between the conflicting objectives so that when you navigate, you see the trade-offs very explicitly, how, what kind of sacrifices are needed to improve some function values. And then in that way, by, by moving around, you can get an idea of, of, to yourself, what, what is the best balance among the conflicting objectives? What kind of sacrifices you are willing to make in some functions to be able to improve the function values that you regard very, very important. So finding the best balance, it is a way of supporting the decision maker and this mm -hmm. graphical user interface plays an important role in this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. This was really wonderful. Thank you, Professor Maitinen for coming. I really enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope that this gave, gave you some kind of an overview of, of some, some perspectives related to multi-objective optimization and, and uh, supporting decision making. And, and many, many, many more things are available. So at my homepage, you can find a lot of papers uh, in different topics if you, if you are interested. But I hope this gave you some kind of an overview of, of these things. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.